Okay, uh, I take it everybody can hear me uh, and welcome to this first uh, BAA lecture of 2021. Uh, I hope you have a prosperous and pleasant new year despite the ongoing circumstances we've all got to deal with. And uh, we're very fortunate tonight to have uh, Professor Eric Fernie uh, speaking to us. Uh, before I introduce Eric though, I just want to say something about uh, the viewing options available to you. Last time, one or two people had a little bit of difficulty uh, with the best viewing option. And I've been advised that this is, uh, you should choose side-by-side -side gallery. So look for the view icon in my screen. It's in the upper right-hand corner. It's a box with three little dots on it. Click on that and it'll give you an option to select side-by-side -side gallery. If you do that, uh, I'm told that will give you the best possible viewing option. Okay, well, it's a pleasure to introduce a lecture by Professor Eric Fernie. I'm not sure I've ever done this before. Uh, Eric's lecture is titled Three Historical Oddities from the Fall of the Roman Empire to the BC AD Divide and the Continent of Europe. Uh, Eric's a long standing BAA member and a friend of the BAA. He served on the council for many years and he's an expert on all sorts of things from ancient architecture to classic comic books. Uh, and apart from, uh, besides very much else, he's probably done more than any other uh, single person uh, for our understanding of insular Romanesque architecture in a European context. So that's enough from me. Uh, Eric, if you'd like to give your lecture, we'll all listen uh, with great interest. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Julian, for your kind words of introduction. I hope everyone can hear me. I am going to begin right at the beginning, that is with the title, and in particular, those historical oddities. History in its primary meaning refers to the events of the past. And I think if you were to look for oddities in that context, you would just be overwhelmed. I'm using it here in its secondary sense, that is the study of those events where uh, oddities are going to be few and far between. I have three possibles to propose, uh, starting then with the fall of the Roman Empire, if I can change this. Uh, it, I'm not talking about the fall in, in any gradual sense over centuries, but with the ending of a succession of emperors, and so in a particular year, and that year is 476. Now, here are five books on the subject of the fall of the Roman Empire in 476. Um, they published over the last couple of decades, and if you look at I think it's the third one, you'll see that the date 476 is explicitly in the title as the fall of the Roman Empire. In the first title, the first uh, book, the uh, date is implicit after Rome, a new cultural history 500 and so on. And with the other three, all you have to do is open them at their contents page and you will see that they are dealing with the same event the fall of the Roman Empire in 476. There's just one problem. The Roman Empire didn't fall in 476. What fell in that year was the Western Roman Empire. And I think the, this goes back to 395 when they decided to divide the empire into a Western Empire and an Eastern Empire. And here's a map, the division between the two halves rather um, uh, happily coincides with the uh, spine of the book from which this map is taken. The Western Empire went on to 476. The Eastern Empire went on for almost another thousand years to 1453. That is the oddity. How has this happened that the event of 476 can be referred to in this way as if the Eastern Empire wasn't Roman. Now, what I have to say immediately after having made this, set out this point, is that I am not 
correcting the authors of those books. And if you'll excuse my language, they all know a damn sight more about the history of the Roman Empire than I do. And that's the mystery, or if you prefer, the oddity. There is, of course, the evidence that the Eastern Empire became increasingly Hellenized. And I've got just two um, events to um, illustrate that. The first is 620, when they changed the official language of the empire from Latin to Greek, a very clear indication. And then uh, 1054, when the church of the Eastern Empire, the Orthodox Church, formally cut its ties with the church in Rome, uh, formalizing something which had been a fact for centuries. Now, these are two very powerful points indicating the Hellenizing of the uh, Eastern Empire and therefore suggesting that it wasn't seen as Roman. However, here are two other facts which indicate very strongly that this is wrong and that the empire was seen as Roman. The first of them I've got is the Battle of Mount in um, uh, 1071. You can just make it out over there in the uh, uh, northeastern corner of uh, uh, Anatolia. I say make it out, the name is not there. Um, this is 1071, the, one of the most important battles in medieval history, where the Turks defeated the troops of the Eastern Empire and proceeded to take control of almost the whole of Anatolia. Now, when they were at this stage ruled by the Seljuk dynasty, the Turks, and when they had achieved this great victory, they restyled themselves as the Seljuks of Rome. And the second example I've got is around 1500, so after the fall of the Eastern Empire, uh, a Russian abbot referred to Moscow as the Third Rome, not the Second Constantinople, but the Third Rome. Now, if you look at the first pair of, uh, of events or uh, whatever you want to call them, um, the language change and the independence of the church, these are two facts sitting there in the historical record waiting to be assessed by scholars. The second two, the ones I've just mentioned about the Turks and the Russian habit, these are straight from the horse's mouth. They obviously saw the Eastern Empire as Roman. So what is the, if that isn't a, a good enough explanation, um, what other one can we propose? Well, I think that the best explanation is that uh, for the widespread treatment of the Eastern Empire as if it wasn't really Roman, is that we changed its name and we started calling it the Byzantine Empire. The term Byzant was used in the Middle Ages in the West for the gold solidus of the Eastern Empire. It obviously comes from the right source, but a coin is not an empire. And as far as I know, the first person to use the word Byzantine for the Eastern Empire was a German scholar writing in the 1550s, but it didn't catch on. For example, Gibbon writing in the 1780s refers straightforwardly to the fall of the Roman Empire in 1453. Then in the 19th century, Byzantine became the norm and as it has remained. Here are the relevant pages, if I can just go to the next slide, of uh, Tapsell's amazing book, collections of uh, dynasties and so on, and rulers within those dynasties. And he is here showing you the rulers from that breaking of the empire into two parts at 395. And if you look at the top, Western emperors, 395 to 476, those are called Western emperors. Look at the Eastern emperors. They are already, right from 395, defined as Byzantine emperors. And the Encyclopedia of the Hellenic Tradition, published in 2000, begins the Byzantine emperors using the label Byzantine with Constantine in 305. And a slightly different way of making the same point, every man's dictionary of dates, 1972, notes that 
and I quote, some earlier Byzantine historians wrote in Latin, e.g. Eunapius around 400. That shouldn't be a surprise. So why? Well, why start calling the Eastern Empire Byzantine? Given that the people who started the change were German, Italian, French, British, etc., uh, I th think that this can be seen as uh, making Roman history, I'm guessing here, obviously, but it, what it, one of its results was that it made Roman history ours, thinking of the West, Western scholarship, as it were. When I first worked on this subject a number of years ago, I considered this making Rome ours as one of the great historiographical thefts. But thinking a bit about it in preparing this lecture, um, I've come to the conclusion that I do need to rethink it. Um, I'll stick by the guess as to the motive for the Western scholars, particularly when they started in the, up in the 19th century. But there's one thing that worries me. And that is, if you're going to have a proper theft, you have to have a victim. And as far as I can see, the people who inhabit the states of the Orthodox Church, and here, can I just thank Cecily Hennessy and Robin Milner Gullen for their help with matters to do with the Orthodox Straits. So the people who live in those states, they seem to be perfectly happy to be thought of as other than Roman or to have the, the empire which lies at the basis of their history, presumably because for the converse reason, that is, it gets them out from under the Roman aegis. And the result of that is that you have these two great civilizations, the Greek and the Roman, rolling together, not only through the whole of antiquity, but through the whole of the Middle Ages as well. So this is one explanation for the phrase, the fall of the Roman Empire in 476, despite it being wrong and known to be so. Right, that's the first one. The second one is very different in character. It is, as it says in the title, to do with the BCAD divide, but specifically with the year zero inserted at the BCAD divide. Right. In 2008, the mathematician Marcus de Sotoy was appointed professor of the public understanding of science at Oxford. He was then interviewed by John Humphreys on the Today programme, and a couple of weeks after that, he reported part of their conversation in the Spectator Diary as follows. Right. And what he says is this. I'm going to read it out. I was a bit stumped when he, that is John Humphreys, said, impress me with a bit of maths then. I decided to turn the tables and ask him a question. If a temple was built in 50 BC and burned down 75 years later, in what year did it get destroyed? Just as I hoped, he fell for my trap. No, not 25 AD, but 26 AD. There was no year zero. The zero was only invented in the seventh century AD by the Indian mathematicians. As I came off air, I must admit, I punched the air in triumph. One nil to maths FC. Right. Now, I want, first of all, to illustrate the point that uh, Du Soto is making about the error that, uh, that happens when you count across the BCAD divide. And I think this helps to do it. I've reduced the age of the temple from 75 years to 10 to make it more manageable in the diagram. So you look at the first one, a temple built in 5 AD and destroyed 10 years later will be destroyed in 15 AD, straightforward. Same thing applies in the BC years. One built in 25 BC and destroyed 10 years later will be destroyed in 15. BC. But a temple built in 5 BC and destroyed 10 years later will be destroyed in 6 AD. And the point that de Soto is making about the way in which you can correct this is, uh, and I apologize for this slide being slightly different, I copied it in a, a different session, so it's slightly fuzzy, 
but it, it's the same in the first three sets. And if you then get to the bottom one, that's 5 BC plus 10, including a year zero between 1 BC and 1 AD. So that uh, gives a, a clear indication of the what you might call the first part of what the Sotoy is saying. And it's clearly correct. Placing the zero there does correct counting across the divide. Now, the second thing is, do Sotoy's explanation for why they didn't have the zero in the original setup. And you'll remember that what he says is that um, if they had had the Indian uh, counting system when they set it up, that uh, they would have uh, used, they would have started counting the years with the year zero. Now, it's with some trepidation, obviously, because I'm taking on a mathematician uh, on a mathematical subject, but it is also a historical subject. And the point is, I disagree with Dusotoy in his explanation for why this uh, zero uh, fits there and why whether it would have been there if they'd been using the Indian counting system. And the point is, uh, a point that I must add, is that Dusotoy is not alone in uh, proposing this. It was proposed by the polymath Stephen J. Gould in 1995 and also by the mathematician Jacqueline de Bourgoin in 2001. Now, despite this support, I am still saying I want to disagree with it. Now, before I say why I disagree with it, there are two things that I want to do. And the first is to record my thanks to those who have helped me with this puzzle. And believe me, I have needed help. As I say, this is a complicated business. So the people in question are Bob Allah, Sandy Heslop, Robert Hillenbrand, Peter Hingley, Roy Rahatke, and Peter Stewart. Now, there's no implication in my thanking them that they will agree with, or they do agree with my arguments or my conclusions. I hope they do, but I make no, I don't want to pass on the implication that they do. And the second thing I want to do is to provide thumbnail sketches of the setting up of the AD system, the BC system, and the setting up of the um, Indian uh, counting system and its transference west. Right, the AD system. In 524, Pope John I commissioned Dionysius Exiguus to calculate the dates of Easter for a batch of future years. At this period, calculating Easter was very complicated, hence this practice of uh, getting them worked out for a batch of future years. And in 524, they had very few left in the file. So he asked Dionysius to uh, 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 conduct the, next, the exercise for the next few years. For counting the years at this time, they used one of the Roman systems, that is, starting um, with the first year of the reign of an emperor. And in 524, they were still counting from the reign of, and here I'm afraid I cannot resist dramatizing it, dot, 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 Diocletian. So we are now in the 240th year from the first year of the reign of Diocletian. And I say this is amazing. It's in fact one of the oddities of the events of history, because Diocletian must have been responsible for the slaughter of more Christians than all the other emperors put together. And there he is still, is from the first year of his reign, that gives you the date of the current year, the year in which um, John is commissioning uh, Dionysius. So Dionysius, I don't know whether it was this fact that occasioned him or suggested it to him, but Dionysius proposed counting the years, not from the first year of the reign of Diocletian, but from the first year of the life of Christ, AD, right. The BC system, 200 years later, around 730, B proposed counting the years before 1 AD backwards. So you get one, two, three BC, etc. And then to the Indian counting system. Now, since 2008, this has been redated from the 7th century to the 4th, 
and I'm sure that de Soto had something to do with this, because the piece of parchment, which is the subject of the redating, on which the invention, the Indian invention of the zero is recorded, is held at Oxford. Now, this is the invention of the zero is one of the most important changes in the whole history of mathematics, and therefore its importance for science is uh, virtually immeasurable. So uh, this uh, redating must have a major impact on the history of Indian thought, but it isn't actually relevant in the present context because the dates of transmission of the Indian counting method westward remain unchanged. That is, the Arabs adopted the system in the late 8th and 9th centuries, and the uh, Europeans adopted it from the Arabs from the 13th century, and uh, by, the, by the late 16th, its use is virtually universal in the West. Right. Now, having done those two things, I can now say why I disagree with de Soto's explanation that if the Indian counting system had been available when the BCAD system was set up, they would have begun counting with a year zero. Right, I have three arguments. The first one is this, de Soto presents the BCAD system as if it was set up in one go. Now, I actually don't blame him for that. He was on air. He wants to be as concise as possible, not go off little uh, tracks to, uh, talking about Dionysus and so on. Uh, but if his argument is um, defensible, then it must be applicable to AD alone, since that was set up first. So the claim must be examined with relation to that separately. If the Indian Arabic modern counting system had been in use at the time, would Dionysius have begun counting the AD years with a year zero? And would the Romans have begun the reigns of the emperors with one if they'd had the system? Well, this is perhaps rather a flabby argument, but I'm afraid I just cannot see why they would have done so. Now, those two things that I'm talking about, the Dionysus and the Romans, they are what ifs because they didn't have the Indian Arabic modern counting system. So I called in evidence the French revolutionaries. And when they set up their new calendar, they called 1793, the first year of the new age, year one of the new age. And that was when the Arabic counting system had been in use in the West for at least two centuries. So that's the first argument. The second argument comes in the form of a question. If de Soto is zero, the one that we've got on the screen in front of us, um, is not there as an automatic part at the start of the Arabic count, Indian Arabic counting system, then what is its status or category? What is it at the BCAD divide? And here I found astronomy useful. Because you take a comet, which appears in the records in the BC years every 60 years, and the same thing in the AD years every 60 years. Over the divide, it's going to appear to uh, reappear after 61 years, which is obviously completely unacceptable. So when I've spoken to um, astronomers about this and asked them why they uh, chose the zero, to correct the counting over the divide, they have given me a de Soto's answer that if the Indian system had been in use, they would have started counting with a zero. I have then given them uh, at least a brief argument against that or said that it's questionable. And their response is actually, we don't care what the explanation is. All we know is that we have to have that zero. And that's the point, that zero is a placeholder. It fills a year between 1 BC and 1 AD. So you do, it doesn't have to be thought of in terms of a system of counting the years. It is just there as a placeholder. And therefore, it could be something else. For example, an ampersand. But of course, it makes sense, since you're dealing with numbers, to put another number in the sequence. So that's the second argument. The third argument 
is that in ordinary usage, we don't start uh, counting with it's zero in the counting of anything. And here's another one. Um, and sorry to be, this is a bit lugubrious, but uh, there you've got uh, one to 10, and those are numbers, each number in its square. Below that, physical objects, you say advertising holdings or cars in a car park, you're asked to count them, you will count them one to 10. And since we're dealing with time and time passes, let's go to a pop concert. The pop singer is singing the first song. The song is not there until it is finished and the crowd are cheering. And then it is the first song. Actually, if it was on the program, it would be song one. And the same thing applies with years. A year is not complete until, is not there until it is complete. And then when it is, it's year one, two, whether you're talking about the life of a child or the age of a motor car. Right, now, there are exceptions to what I've been saying. That is no starting counting with a, uh, a zero. Um, and I must note them because it's important to do so. I know of three in Asia. Um, I understand that there are Hindu and Buddhist sects which start counting with a zero. I haven't been able to pin that down. So what uh, the third example is um, very useful because it's actually got legal standing. And I'm talking here, sorry, about the uh, Korean culture. So let me uh, just imagine for a minute that you are running a convenience store in Britain and a young person comes into the store whom you happen to know is Korean and they ask for a packet of cigarettes. Now, you know, you're not supposed to sell them to anyone who's under 18. So you say, how old are you? And they reply, 17. So your next question is, are you 17 in Korean terms or British terms? And if they say Korean terms, you can sell them the cigarettes, no problem. So there's a, a very clear exception. Uh, now, there are also exceptions in the West. I know of two. First, some railway station platforms are numbered zero. Uh, best known, of course, is King's Cross, you also find one at Stockport in Greater Manchester. These arise where a new platform has been built next to uh, platform one. And the authorities have thought to themselves, well, we could renumber all the platforms and uh, count the new one as one and change the numbers of all the others, but it would be very expensive and it would probably confuse a lot of people who had got used to which platform they caught which train from. So they just called them platform zero. And the second example is much more recent than that. This is since last April, where a, a person, the first person in a city or other context to have caught the COVID-19 virus is referred to as patient zero. Uh, or in Poland, for example, frontline staff prioritized to get the vaccine are identified as group zero. And I think that this is being done perfectly justifiably in order to dramatize the situation. It's uh, a use of the starting to count with the zero, but it has no uh, place in standard uh, counting as we do it in, um, in, in, in the West. Right, those are the exceptions. So now that's, and that, that's the end, if you like, of my third argument. But I must also mention line counting. I hope I'll explain, be able to explain why. The ways, uh, the, the system of counting that you see on the screen here is called strip counting. This is where you place the number in its own square and you arrange the frames in a strip, just like the actions in the frames of a comic strip. It's uh, exactly the same usage. Now with uh, line counting, you place the number of the unit over the line, which separates it from the next unit. There's the line, which is represented by that one. The one represents this just like it does here, and it separates it from the next one and you just run through and there's unit 10. Right, now, uh, 
about this line system, the crucial thing about it, one of the things I want to stress is that, well, first of all, I've got to say, it does introduce the zero there. The, what I must stress though, is that this zero does not refer to one of the units. It doesn't refer, for example, to this, that's unit one. And the same thing with one BC, the uh, zero would not refer to it. What the zero refers to is the line which starts the sequence, which lies at the, 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 the start, if you like, of the first unit. And uh, we do use this in everyday life because it's how um, temperature gauges work. And here's one of those public ones in Canada. Now, you probably won't be able to make this out very clearly, but those zeros there represent that line. Uh, the, and the, the units above are units above zero, and the units below are the units below zero. And if you look at the 10, 20, 30, etc., each one of those represents a unit, a space. The zero does not. Now, I wanted to mention the line system so as to get it clear that it wasn't another exception. But I have another reason for wanting to mention it. And that is because it um, has been used in the Maths is Fun website to present De Sotois, and I don't believe it was De Sotois who did this. In fact, I, I must say, I, I am absolutely certain it wasn't, to, um, to represent um, De Sotois correcting of counting across the BC AD divide. Let me see if I can get it here. Um, now, uh, this is, yes, I must get the cursor out here. Um, so what you've got on this side in this column is the their presentation of the BC and AD years as set up in the first millennium. And then in this column on the left, this is where, with the zero, how uh, the assumption is that this will correct counting across the, uh, uh, the BCAD divide. Now, please remember, actually, perhaps I should put the next slide on the screen straight away, because it gives you um, De Soto's uh, placeholder zero in the sequence. Now, remember that um, zero is not uh, for a unit, it's just for a line. So just unthink it for a minute and look at what we've got here. That is 1 AD, 2 AD, 3 AD, 4 AD. And before that, 1 BC, 2, 3, 4. In other words, this sequence is exactly how the BC and AD years have always been presented. The sequence which actually produces the error counting across the BCAD divide. Now, if that's the case, what on earth have they done with their presentation of the AD and BC years as theoretically originally set up? Now here, I want to be very careful. I just want to stress once again, there's the line for 4 AD that represents, talking about this lot here, that represents the, the year. This is the year three, year two, year one. Same thing with the BC years, four, three, two, one. Now count them down on, the, on this side. That is year five, year four, year three, year two, year one. That is one AD coming down from that point. Same thing with the BC years, four, three, two, one. And look what they've done. They have turned the venerable bead into an ace bubbler who said, oh, I see, if I'm going to set up the BC year, I've got to make 1 BC the same year as 1 AD. This site has been up for years. It really should be corrected to De Soto's system. Right. Now, um, there are other things that I could say about this. Um, for example, the... Uh, they would, if, they'd, if they'd be using the Indian number system, they would have started counting with a zero, has been used to explain why we celebrated the start of the third millennium in 2000 AD rather than 2001. All I can say about that is that you can look at the historical record and you can disprove that claim in short order. 
but I'm not going to do so. Enough is enough. I will just leave it at that, um, saying that what I find odd about uh, Tsoto's argument is his claim that if they had been using the Indian Arabic modern counting system, they would have begun counting those years, the AD years, with a year zero. Right, turn the page and turn to the last of the three, the continent of Europe. The definition of a continent is unambiguous, despite the fact that you can obviously find it in lots of different languages and even with different phrasings in one language. And the virtually standard definition of a continent goes like this. A continent is a large mass of land surrounded by oceans and connected to another mass of land, if at all, by nothing more than a narrow isthmus. I think that's clear. I think it's absolutely clear. And in the sorts of publications which provide a definition like that, then you will find listed the continents, the seven, Africa, Asia, Europe, North America, South America, Antarctica, and Australia. But Europe, has a border with Asia, which is more than 2,400 miles long, hardly a narrow isthmus. Now, there are, of course, books on the subject which get this absolutely right. And it gives me great pleasure to cite two wonderful examples and wonderful books, is how I should put it. The first is Norman Davies's. Uh, 1996 doorstopper volume of the history of Europe, where he calls Europe a peninsula. And in order to force us to reassess our assumptions, he prints his maps with West at the top. And here's an example. And I think one has got to admit this does force one to reassess one's assumptions. Very, very uh, effective um, um, uh, idea, this. And the other book that I have in mind is that by Martin Lewis and Karen Wigan. This is uh, on meta geography of 1997, in which the authors examine how thinking in terms of continents has distorted our view of history. And they actually deal with the modern history, the 1920th century history of the idea of Europe as a continent. Thus, I'm not in any way including books such as these in uh, my criticism of the definition of Europe as a continent. Now, I am referring, in fact, to, to textbooks and encyclopedias. And here I find looking or concentrating on the number of continents is helpful. Starting with the traditional tally of seven, here is a French school map, which was very kindly sent me by Marcello Angin in Poitiers. And he says, children in French schools are taught that there are seven uh, uh, continents. It's exactly how he was taught. May I say it's exactly how I was taught. And I suspect it was probably how virtually everyone in this Zoom room, if I can call it that, uh, was taught as well. So it's standard. I've uh, uh, even pestered colleagues from Sweden to Italy and Ireland to Poland, and they all say the same thing. Now, the Penguin Encyclopedia says there are six continents. And when I read that, I thought my hopes rose. They're going to get it right. Europe will not be a continent. Well, that isn't the case. The one they omitted was Antarctica. And why? Well, it's covered in ice and therefore we don't really know how big it is. Now that was published in the 1960s. The argument might be slightly different now. The Oxford English Dictionary supplement for 1933 cites an example which says that there are five continent. And once again, my hopes rose, but once again, I was disappointed. Antarctica is out and Australia is out. Why? Because it isn't big enough to be a continent. 
It's just a big island. Now you compare that juggling with whether something is a big island or a small continent with the boundary between Europe and Asia, and you're in two different worlds. And finally, also from the Oxford English Dictionary Supplement of 1933, an instance with four continents. And here I was absolutely certain that Europe was going to be correctly defined. In other words, you've got, no, have I got a, we've got Africa, we've got Eurasia, we've got North America and South America. But again, I was wrong. How do we get the total down to four? We call North and South America a single continent. Now the Panama Canal is about 60 miles long. I would say that that strip of land joining North America and South America is an almost perfect example of what is meant by a narrow isthmus. So how on earth is this to be explained? Well, the answer of course lies in history and deep in history. There are two stages as far as I can see. And the first one is the uh, invention and use of TO maps. This is an invention uh, early in the first millennium, but the best surviving examples are of the ninth and 10th centuries. And here are a few of them. With the TO map, the Mediterranean forms a vertical axis with East at the top. So you have Africa on the right, Europe on the left and Asia ahead, as you can see, I think in at least uh, three of those examples. And the same is true of the fourth. Now the boundary between Europe and Asia is the river Don, the river Tanais. The boundary between uh, Asia and, sorry, between Africa and Asia, keep it in the same order, is curious because we would expect, it isn't, the Red Sea, as we would expect, it's the Nile. Now, this must be done as it's perhaps, well, it's clear in all of the examples, this is being done for symmetry. And why should they be looking for symmetry? Well, a possible guess is because it makes it look created. In other words, we're back in Genesis. And that connection is underlined by the presence in three out of these four examples of the three sons of Noah, Ham, Shem and Japheth in respectively Africa, Asia and Europe. So in other words, Asia, uh, Europe as a continent on a par with Africa and Asia has biblical support. That's the first phase. The second phase is the uh, ex of the explanation is the European colonizing of the world. Now that phrase is a huge overstatement because of that swathe of countries, Japan, China, Iran, and Arabia, and the smaller countries alongside Korea, and Nepal, and Afghanistan, which were not colonized. However, there is one sense in which it isn't misleading to speak of a European colonization of the world, and that is in publication. Now, of course, the movable type was invented by the Chinese, but once the Europeans had taken it over in the 16th, 17th centuries, and then eventually the West uh, in subsequent centuries, just took over the world or created the world of publication, and it became a worldwide phenomenon. And therefore, Europe as a continent, which is expressed in virtually every publication before the 20th century, uh, is a fact laid down in so many books and publications. Now, Lewis and Weigand, I mentioned earlier that they go into the, um, uh, the, the modern um, history of Europe as a continent. And one of the things they cite is scholars who acknowledge that there is this long land boundary between Europe and Asia, but they say, and I'm quoting here, we can't leave it out. It's far too important, to which one can only reply, pardon, but that's what is said. And 
it's, it's there anyway. With the recent demonstrations seeking a, a reassessment of colonial history, I've been waiting for someone to demand that Europe ceases to be classified as a continent and should be referred to instead as a subcontinent like India, for example. Well, perhaps I have, but I haven't heard it. It hasn't become widespread. I've also checked the continent of Europe on the internet. And uh, uh, Wikipedia is very interesting on the subject because it too acknowledges that the, there is a long, Europe is odd in having a long land boundary. But it says it is considered to be a continent for a variety of reasons. It mentions, for example, the great weight of history, which we've already seen and which I entirely agree with. But then it says, and, and this is actually what it says first, this is its first reason. And if I can find the, co the quote, it is considered to be a continent, quote, because of its great physical size. Now, here on the next slide, you will see the sizes of the seven units, not calling them continents, but uh, the units involved, including uh, uh, Europe and Asia. And you will see, Asia, 17 million, Africa, 11, North America, 9, uh, South America, 6.9, Antarctica, 5, and you have Europe down there with Australia in the 3 million square mile group. Great physical size is not something which um, separates Europe from the others uh, and enables it to be called a continent. It's no more to, and in fact, I see this as a sanitized version of those uh, earlier claims, we can't leave Europe out because it's too important. We can't leave Europe out because it's too big. And of course, it isn't too big. Right. Now, having said that, that is the end of the third oddity. At this point, uh, I would normally offer a summing up of what I've been saying. But I thought it might be more useful in this case to try ranking the three examples in terms of their degree of oddity. So here goes, starting with the least odd. And here I had no hesitation in placing the year zero at the BC AD divide. And I have three reasons for saying that. The first is it is much more complicated than the other two. And secondly, the uh, def uh, let me see where it is. Second, because it involves mathematics and history, and those are two very different disciplines in character in the way they work. And it's not uh, difficult to think to imagine that those two disciplines could disagree or come to different conclusions on the basis of similar information. So that's the second reason. The third reason is because it is a matter of a difference of opinion rather than an internal contradiction, which is what you have in the other two. So turning to those other two, I had much more difficulty in deciding between them. The continent of Europe has a very strong case for the top spot because you have a definition in line one, which is absolutely unambiguous and followed in millions, possibly billions of publications by a statement which includes Europe, which clearly doesn't belong to the definition as given the line above. But I still said this is number two because of the weight of history as mentioned in Wikipedia. You've been doing something for literally thousands of years. You just carry on doing it. So that's not a, uh, uh, an excuse. It is, however, some sort of explanation. So that means that the fall of the Roman Empire in 476 is, in my view, the top example. Because with this one, there are no mathematicians to agree or disagree over the subject. And there is no weight of history. Instead, you have a statement which is entirely within the world of historians and historians moreover who know exactly what they're doing. This is clearly for me, the oddest. Thank you.
Thank you very much indeed, Eric. Uh, that fascinating, fascinating talk. Billions of publications, eh? Crap, makes you think, doesn't it? Uh, we're going to take uh, questions for uh, Eric, and we're going to take them in the Q&A box, please, not in the chat box. So if you have a question for Eric, and there's one there already, I see, or it's a comment, uh, would you please would you please put it into the Q&A box, which you can find uh, on a PC anyway at the bottom of the screen in the centre. Just click on that and, and type away and then send it, and I'll read it out and, and Eric can, can answer. Uh, Eric, I wonder, of these three oddities you've been speaking about, I wonder which you think the most important is in terms of its implications for architectural history. That might, or architectural historians, uh, that might sound a bit of a, a stupid question in a way because clearly all three of them are interesting and you know problematic in different ways. But uh, I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that just while we wait for some questions to come through. Well, uh, Julian, I, I don't, in fact. I can't see any ranking in terms of the relevance for architectural history. But if I force myself to look at it, obviously the definition of the continent of Europe has nothing to do with that. Uh, the closest is probably the year zero at the BC uh, AD uh, divide. Because uh, if you want to, you can uh, say that the error that you get, it doesn't affect architectural historians though in the way that it affects astronomers. And so I, I honestly put it this way, I didn't approach any of these questions thinking as an architectural historian. So I wasn't looking for answers to no. the, see what I mean. Yes, I do. I just thought I'd, I'd warm up with that. Thank you very much, Eric. Yeah. A few people have now sent questions in. Uh, Clive Saville wrote, first of all, but it seems to be more of a comment than a question. Clive, I wonder if you could indicate if you want me to read this out. And I'll go on to David Lerman. David uh, asks, have you considered the fact that I suspect emperors and certainly monarchs over at least the past 1,000 years have caused regnal years to be used to indicate specific dates as well as the passage of time, as opposed to the dating methods of historians described by you, Harry? Absolutely. Assuming, yeah, yes. assuming that you have, do you have any comments? I don't think I do. I agree entirely with that. Um, you start in year one and you go to how many ever, a, a, how many ever regnal years there are. I, I, so I'm not sure that that's different from what I've been saying. Perhaps you could ask David if he would enlarge on that. Yes, well, uh, he can hear and perhaps he will. Uh, the next question uh, we've got here is from Robert Shepherd. He says, I agree. Uh, that the year following Christ's birth must be year one, inconvenient that the year does not start on the date of birth. This is consistent with the normal usage that the first year of one's life ends with one's first birthday. Yeah. Surely it follows that logically the year before, the one leading up to the birth, is the year zero. Note these numbers are simply labels and it is clearly expedient from a counting point of view to have a year zero. Well, I would disagree. I don't think anyone would say year zero for the first year of a life or the age of a motor car. I don't see the advantage and I don't see the habit. I don't know of anybody who says, ah, that's your year zero, so that when you're coming up to your second year, that's your first year. It just is not in my experience. It's true, Eric, but then again, when one has a baby, an infant, I mean, one doesn't say that the infant is one if the infant is six months old. One says, well, the infant is six months old. And that's a way of saying, well, the infant is still in his or her year zero. Uh, all right, if you want to. I, I can simply see no reason for calling that year zero. It's the first year which is not complete yet. And I'm talking uh, all the time about um, standard common usage. And I simply haven't heard it. Uh, uh, if you say, how old's your baby? Oh, it's zero years old. I just haven't heard that. No, no. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so Richard, Richard Jem asks briefly, Eric, do you think the adoption of the term Byzantine 
was motivated in part by attitudes of cultural, even racist, superiority. I think that's probably, well, you can't get away from thinking that if you accept my guess, and I do stress that it is a guess, but it would be cultural superiority, absolutely. Yes, I think Richard is right. Okay, and um, someone- Julian. Yes, Richard. I don't seem to be able to type into the Q&A because I'm a panelist. So I'm going to have to ask oh. my question All right, you're user live, <laughs> so to speak. Okay. Um, I'm interested, you. Eric, in, as it were, the history of the application of the term Europe yes. to a body of land. Yes. And my understanding is that it is, generally speaking, not often used before about 1500. Yeah. Um, I've read recently, for example, that while it was a Carolingian, an occasional Carolingian usage, you start finding it again in what um, we might laughingly call the Renaissance. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, yes, I would simply take us back to that slide because these are all from the 9th and 10th centuries and they all name Europe as a continent. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I've got a couple of anonymous questions now, and they're very brief. So I'll just ask them quickly, Eric, if that's okay. Would you like to say something about the changing eastern boundary of Europe? The changing eastern boundary of Europe is fascinating. Um, in fact, I can uh, approach it in a very tangential way, but nonetheless, one which is perhaps significant. Um, I was asking people about Europe and how they saw it, uh, as I say, you know, from Ireland to Poland and so on. I didn't have any contacts in Russia, so I asked Robin Milder Gulland if he would ask one of his contacts, and he asked somebody, and the really fascinating thing was that she said she didn't understand the question, and that you actually got the boundary of Europe, the current boundary of Europe, in Russia. Whereas, it, well, the River Don is also in Russia, but far west of the Urals. So we're talking about two different boundaries here. The uh, traditional, the ancient one, the one that appears in the um, uh, TO maps is at the River Don. And now we take it with the mountains, the Urals. I don't know that I have anything to say about the significance of that. I simply note it. Okay, thank you. Um, Robert Shepard, whose question I read out before, says, I cannot have been clear enough. Probably you were, Robert, and no, I just wasn't clear enough. But he says, I was suggesting that the year zero is the one before the birth leading up to it. Uh, that's, that's point taken. Right. Uh, Eric, another anonymous uh, attendee asks, does it help to resolve the fall of the Roman Empire question? to think of history as a process rather than a series of events. His history is a process rather than... A, I, don't, I don't know that I followed the question. Um, mm, no, uh, perhaps, perhaps that person could expand on that. Uh, I don't want to speculate on it because there's a lot of questions still to ask you. It's generating a lot of questions. I'm rather pleased about that because it takes the pressure off me. Uh, Paul Hayward uh, comments, surely one problem with your approach to the final oddity is that the concept of a continent is a relatively modern scientific geological idea. For the Greeks, Romans and medieval writers, Europe was pars mundi, a part of the world. The two concepts need not align. Their modern uh, attempt, uh, their modern attempt to al align them is a product of the rise of modern science, particularly of the 19th and early 20th centuries. I would agree with that entirely. And if you want to put these uh, TO maps into that category and say they're not thinking in terms of continents, I'm perfectly happy with that. I think that they help us because of their biblical status to explain the fact in, that in the Renaissance, Europe was called a continent. But it doesn't mean that uh, the 
idea of a continent was as clear in the 9th and 10th centuries as it is in the modern period. I'm very happy with that. Okay, I've just had in the chat uh, something about the quality or lack of of my voice. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a problem that many people are having. People ask, I'm um, asked if I can let the questioner ask the question, as, as my voice is splintered. Uh, I'm reluctant to do that because it, lead, it can lead to chaos. And we've got a lot of questions coming in on this. But the person who made that comment, if my voice is still splintered, and as you put it, and if other people are experiencing this, then please can you tell me, and uh, we'll change it. Okay, Eric, the first comment that came up even before you finished speaking was from Clive Savile. And Clive says, AD means Anno Domini. Year one in theory starts with the birth of Christ. Year one is his first year of life. Year two starts at the end of year one, etc. The question for me, is how one counts the end of BC. It seems to me that BC ends with year one too, year one as well. So the BC AC divide is BC running down to the end of year one BC yes. and then running up to the end of year one AD. Yes. It is only possible to have a zero unless there is uh, a nothing before the start. And in this case, there is no nothing, question mark. Absolutely. The way we present the BC AD year is exactly as you have just described. That is up to 1 BC, and then there is a line, and then you go 1 AD. There is no zero. And when Dusotoy inserts that zero, he is doing it, as I've said, <laughs> as a placeholder. It isn't a number in a sequence of years but you make it into a number in the sequence of years so that you correct counting across the divide. Right. Jonathan Neal has just put in, uh, you don't need to respond to this, Eric, at all, because you've said your business, but he points out that the, the NHS Red Book is to draw parents' lists, age profiles, starting from zero. Up ah. to uh, so anyway, there's always a, there's always a counter example. Yes, um, exactly. I'm quite happy to learn of other examples. Paul Sanders says, is it useful to describe an 80-year-old as in his or her ninth decade? Uh, that's, a, that's a question I've had fun with my children who were born in the noughties, telling them they're coming into their third decade. So uh, I'm interested in what you say. That is that useful to tell them they're in their ninth decade. I'm having difficulty understanding your voice too, Julian. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, if, this goes, that... if this goes on, then uh, somebody else will have to ask questions. Um, I'll tell you what. If anybody else has difficulty, then perhaps Richard Plant or Meg could ask the questions from this point on. Right. Um, Paul Sanders simply asks whether it is useful for an 80-year-old to, uh, to think of an 80-year-old as being in his or her ninth decade. Ah, yes. <laughs> That's a very good question. I've just had a, a very interesting correspondence about this very fact, because with a, a somebody else who's uh, just, just got into their 80s, and it's very confusing. This is the only respect in which the Roman numbering system oops, is superior to the um, Arabic numbering system. And that is that with the Arabic numbering system, the one which characterizes the second decade appears in the top number of the first decade. So you have this happening again and again and again. When you get to 80, you are completing the, the, the previous decade. You go to 81 and you're into the next decade, despite the fact that you've got that eight in the 80 uh, behind you, as it were. And the person I was uh, corresponding with was Bevis Hillier, who was the person who uh, recommended or suggested to uh, the government that uh, we celebrate the turn of the millennium in the year 2000. 
and he takes my point that it should be 2001 technically, but it just doesn't sound right. Uh, you know, it doesn't sound as much of a, a, a celebratory date as the year 2000. Now, right at the end of the lecture, I mentioned that you can disprove the claim that that is explained by the same thing, you know, the uh, if they'd had the Indian modern uh, counting system, they would have started with the year zero. Because if you look up when the um, British state acknowledged the start of a new year, a new decade, a new century is what I'm thinking of, a new century, in 1700, 1800 and 1900, they all do it on the 1st of January, 171, 181. 19, 1, and 21. It's only when we get to the third millennium, and as Bevis said, it's just so perfect, you know, to have the, uh, the millennial number, apparent millennial number of 2000, to get us into the 2000. But there it is in the uh, government records. Previous centuries, it's in 18, 1, 17, 1, etc. Sure. So if somebody here, somebody here asks, does that mean we have to have 2020 again? Um, <laughs> I'm going to let Richard Plant start asking the questions because uh, there has been a bit of trouble with my, with my uh, with my signal or something. So Richard, over to you. Um, you sound like a Dalek, Julian. Um, I hope I don't. Could you let me know if I do sound like a Dalek? You sound like Richard. That's good. Yeah. Yes. Um, Peter Ledger writes, Eric, at the risk of, risk of lowering the tone, today <laughs> organisations are somewhat cavalier in their use of the term Europe. The Eurovision Song Contest includes <laughs> Iceland. In football, the European Championship includes Israel. And I might add, Peter, you're not, I think, keeping up to date because the Eurovision Song Contest also includes Australia. I take it the question... Uh, is addressing the idea that continents are also uh, imaginative, imagined communities as much as physical ones. Yes, I've been as nonplussed as, as you are by the Eurovision Song, song Contest, including uh, countries that are outside Europe. But I mean, it doesn't matter really. It's not. It's not as if they're saying we have got to re-define um, uh, Europe to include Australia. So. <laughs> um, more on the yes well uh, did, haven't they won I'm not quite sure I don't keep up either Peter um, David Lerman returns no I've gone ah you see it takes a certain kind of expertise to answer these questions to ask these questions oh, which geez, Julian has in a much greater degree than I do uh, come back. Clive Savile returns with, surely there are two zeros. Zero for BC is year uh, one AD and zero for AD is year one of BC. <laughs> yes, I've thought about that too. And I wondered why, I, I, if you asked to Sotoy, I, I suspect he would say, well, if you're dealing with zero, then it, the two things merge. The, the zero that he puts in can do for the AD years and the BC years. Uh, but the crucial point that I'm making is that we wouldn't have started counting with it anyway. And that uh, therefore the zero is a placeholder and therefore that question of should you start the BC years with a zero as well is not relevant because the zero is placed there as a functional item. Okay, good. I think um, I think uh, having lowered the tone, unless Julian can see something, which ah, there's a there's a comment here from Stephen Brindle. Dear Eric, excellent, thought-provoking stuff. Considering Europe as a continent and seeing it as separate from Africa and Asia becomes meaningless in ancient history. Dividing the Roman, Greek-speaking or Arabic-speaking worlds into two or three. 
Hats off to Henri Pirenne and Fernand Brodel for seeing the Mediterranean as a focus of human activity and culture rather than as a continental divide. Hats off to you too for discussing this all so interestingly. Ah, thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Richard, John Osborne's question above SBs. Yes, John Osborne asks, can you think of an actual example of a significant miscalculation based on believing that there was a year zero? Based on believing that there was a year zero? Yes. In other words, um, what have we got wrong? Well, from... I think I would have to rephrase the question and say, can you think of something where it, it, there has been an error as a result of including the year zero as a placeholder. I don't know if that makes sense. Perhaps, John, you could put the question again. And I'll think it. Oh, sorry, you're reading out what John has said. I was just reading out what John just said, yes. Can you read it out again? Though? I shall. There's more Icelandic fun. Mm -hmm. uh, from Margaret Cormack. However, there we go. Can, can you think of an actual example of a significant miscalculation based on believing that there was a year zero? And the answer is no, I don't think I can. Okay. Uh, the, it's just that believing in a year zero is not the right explanation for the presence of that zero at the BCAD divide. Okay, um, I think we are possibly coming towards the end of the questions. Mm -hmm. Margaret Cormack notes, someone wanting to mail me a path in Iceland last week could not do so because according to the UK post office, there are no flights to Europe. And yet Iceland was one of the few countries allowing flights from the UK. And these are the somewhat sad circumstances <laughs> in which we find ourselves. Yes. Well, uh, perhaps, yeah, perhaps I could just comment on that because one of the things that I am not in any way criticizing is uh, the standard, for example, a couple who go on holiday to Cornwall every year and a friend says, oh, when are you off to the Southwest? And they say, ah, oh, we're branching out this year. We're going to the continent. Now, that is completely different from what I've been talking about. It is just language usage because everybody knows what they mean. Nobody's going to think, oh, I wonder if they're going to Thailand or India. The, in, in that sense, it's just a matter of usage. And usage can do what it likes, as far as I'm concerned, provided that Nobody is confused by it. Thank you, Professor Wittgenstein. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, fair, fair comment. <laughs> okay, well, I think we are um, probably coming to the end of the questions. And with that, it probably falls to me, unless the dialect is going to kick in again to thank you, Eric, for a wonderful and stimulating talk and to wish everyone uh, the happiest of Twelfth Nights and to enjoy their somewhat fragmented, fragmented BAA Twelfth Night parties. I've, I've poured myself a glass of delicious whiskey in order to celebrate that myself and to look forward to seeing you again in a month and yes. that i hope unless julian is going to no nothing more from me richard but thank nothing you more from julian <laughs> so thank you thank you once again eric and pleasure, um, richard. thank you lovely to see you and you thank okay you. cheerio bye, bye.